so yeah, we are the Fedora Engineering and Steering Committee. Our primary uh, purpose is to uh, go through the uh, the changes for each Fedora release and approve or dis or uh, decline their inclusion in Fedora, and to settle technical uh, disputes when necessary. That has been few and far between for the last couple of years, which is which is great. People are getting along better. Is that also true? Maintain maintain some policies uh, that are not necessarily about packaging. So there is this, there are the packaging guidelines. We don't maintain those. Uh, Fedora Packaging Committee does. Some of us are in both of them. And uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but there are policies like the non-responsive maintainer policy or the fails to build from source, fails to install policy or uh, the uh, Fedora updates policy. This all goes through FESCO and uh, is either written by a FESCO member and then approved or, or written by somebody else and then approved. And if there are exceptions to be made from such policies, then FESCO uh, needs to uh, put their rubber stamp on them as well. Speaking of rubber stamps, we have a question in the Q&A. What should the actual rubber stamp dimensions be? Now, I suspect that David uh, was referring to the physical dimensions. But uh, I think it belongs at, at least the uh, sixth or seventh dimension. I have real questions. Uh, so what do FESCO members see as the biggest technical issue to solve or opportunity to take in the coming year? Because he's not going to start us off with any easy ones like David did. Wow. In the coming year, uh, I'm really worried about the Bugzilla thingy, but that's not going to happen in one year, right? Uh, well, I mean, RHEL 10 is in the next year. Yeah, but as far as I know, RHEL 9 will keep Bugzilla. So as for the next 10 years, we, we can keep it as well. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about Bugzilla. I mean, like from from the perspective of what we're going to see in the next year. Oh, so yeah, if there right. are 40 branches into RHEL 10, that means that we're going to see a lot of jockeying in the next year for features that are coming out of the woodworks just to make it in time for the cutoff. So that happened with the RHEL 9 cycle with uh, 32, 33, and 34 just getting slammed with feature changes. And I expect to see the same thing with 38, 39, and 40. Yeah, it, it basically happens every time, every cycle. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the better things to come out of the, uh, the new three-year RHEL plan, however, is that those uh, those are starting to actually spread out a little bit more, and we're getting a few more per release now that people know, oh, shoot, I've only got, you know, five uh, Fedora releases before that this is uh, out. I got to, people are actually, in, at least people internal to Red Hat are starting to actually send their uh, change requests earlier in Fedora, which I think is a good thing for both Fedora and RHEL. If that's it, if that is true, then it is a good thing. But I, I, don't, I, don't, feel I, don't, I don't share your optimism, Stephen. <laughs> that is our dynamic. Yeah. Uh, it is aspirational for sure, as Gwen says. And I think that if that actually does happen, it'd be fantastic. But um, we'll see if we manage to break any records. Uh, with the door 38 or 39 in terms of number of changes. And if it, if we do, then we're pretty much on track to have the same problem we did last time. Although it's not a bad problem, it's a good problem to have, but it does make for some chaotic development around around that time. So kind of to get back to the, the original question, uh, one of the problems or one of the things here is that Fesco isn't really looking ahead over the next year or two, I mean, we are and as, as individuals and contributors, but FESCO as a body is more reactive than proactive. It's more, what are people working on and we're going to approve your change rather than, hey, this thing is cool, we should go do it because we don't actually order people around like that, so. Yeah, in the um, occasional yeah. events that that happens, it's because somebody sitting on Fesco happens to be it's think, oh, hey, that's a good idea. I'll go file a change for that, and I'll get to work on it. But it's not yep. like we're telling others. We, we don't dictate to the to the Fedora project what work to do because that would kind of defeat the entire purpose of Fedora, which is to get ideas from everywhere. 
Well, I think one way in which we actually do make some proactive decisions or uh, help plan for the future is when we look at some change proposals, uh, we usually take into account, is this, uh, is this doable? Is this manageable at the distribution level? Uh, what will the fallout be in the next release or two? Uh, so we take this, uh, the future into account when we make those decisions, but we're not really making proactive decisions out of the blue, so without input from, uh, from other people. So basically one, uh, to come back to one of the uh, technical decisions that will, uh, will be difficult in the next year or so is uh, I'm not really looking forward to the fallout from the removal of uh, uh, JDK packages on 32-bit uh, architectures. And uh, that's not going to be fun, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's actually one of the uh, more interesting general yeah. questions uh, for Fedora. And I might suggest that if somebody wanted to put this in the QA later, Q and A later, uh, over the last couple of years, we've definitely, as Fedora, changed the way that we've dealt with uh, language stacks as a whole in Fedora. And I, I'd actually be a little curious to see people's feedback on whether or not that seems to be going in the right or wrong directions. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, have we uh, avoided the uh, Ben's question sufficiently at this point, do you think? I just wanted to say that one of the technical issues that will probably hit us very soon and it might be in the coming year is the Padir stuff and GitLab stuff and the general GitForge idea. Uh, it's like hanging in the air somewhere where it was, the decision has been made and nothing is happening. So uh, we'll see what Fesco will have to do with that. Uh, I will say that uh, it's not that nothing is happening, it's that nothing has been particularly visible and that's probably yeah, uh, that's what I mean uh, nothing is happening because when something invisible happens in Fedora uh, for for me at least it's like nothing is happening I mean it is nothing is happening if it's invisible nothing is happening yeah like, like there's a lot of invisible yeah. things but you know from people's perspective because they're invisible they're not happening and then people ask about it and it's still not happening because it's invisible so like it's not happening yeah, and then things just kind of land fait accompli. But we'll, uh, I, I'm sure we'll try to be more uh, open about the GitLab, GitLab stuff once uh, it gets to a it gets to a point where we actually know if it's even feasible. Uh, so, if anybody else has anything for this topic, otherwise uh, we've got another one. Why do packages some packages not get pushed to updates? For example, LibreOffice 735 is not available for Fedora 36 on Bodhi, even though there's a Koji build. The so maintainer hasn't know. submitted it yet? Like, some, yeah. nobody did it. Somebody needs to do it. And if nobody does it, then it's not done. It's that yeah. simple. One thing that's a little different from Fedora versus other distributions is that when a build actually hits the build system, it is not auto-submitted to, to be considered to release for updates. Someone has to manually do it. Um, that may be something that will change in the longer term future, but we'll. But for now, it's not. It's sort of you can kind of see what that workflow would look like with Rawhide as it does that right now. But uh, for stable updates, so far that isn't a thing. So that's that's the the more general answer as to why you'll sometimes see builds in Koji that never make it to people because that happens or doesn't happen. Really, and, and to be fair, it might be that the maintainer pulled that down and tested it and found some problem, and they're working on it. Or there's a lot of other build, or there's a lot of reasons that could be going on there. Really, you'd have to talk to the maintainer. Well, it, it would be really great to extend the automatic rawhide workflow to uh, stable releases, so that you could somehow, when submitting the Kojic build mark the build as just proceed with the update for this. I don't want to look at it again. 
there's a lot of things I would like about automation to go forward in, in Fedora stuff. I realistically don't think it will ever happen because uh, there's too much resistance to that kind of making people's lives easier. Well, I, I, I see this, well, maybe not resistance, but lack of uh, um, plans for this to happen. I mean, like people don't seem eager to implement this. And I, I don't really understand this because I think it could help us a lot. I mean, we have like RPM auto spec done halfway and not moving forward for the last year. We have um, some Q&A automatism in place, but it's not, um, I mean, it's moving very, very slowly and it should really move faster. Well, so there are two big problems with the way everyone approaches automation in Fedora. One, people have to do stuff. And two, um, it has to be, uh, uh, we can't do um, basically uh, life-changing, uh, flag day life-changing events for things. Those two things make it extremely difficult for Fedora workflows to change, um, whether that's for something positive or something negative. Like for RPM Autospec, for example, um, to if we wanted to actually make no, no RPM Autospec is developed insofar as all the the, the pieces are made and whatever. But like if we wanted to make RPM Autospec like 100% part of the thing, we should have just adjusted the build system to make it so it always ran and got used. But we don't want to do that. We want to make it so it's opt-in and slower. There are good reasons for doing that because it is a workflow change. There are aspects of it that need to change. There are different considerations. But it is still fundamentally the approach that we have for every modernization so far has been that uh, it has to be done piece by piece. So take, for example, the EVRB proposal that Alexandra Fedorova has up on uh, the mailing list and on discourse. Uh, so far, the whole mindset has been around, let's make it so people have to change their spec files to make it work. Um, that's going to make it fail. Like, to put it bluntly, any kind of modernization proposal that requires people to do work to take advantage of it is going to make it fail longer term. It may have some adoption by enthusiasts, but longer term, across the, the long tail, you're just not going to get the adoption and will always be stuck. Um, so there's a mindset shift that has to be made in order to think about automation if we want to have a broad-based adoption and like truly make things easier for people. But, you know, to each his own. Well, I mean, I, I think that he, you make it sound as if we actually wanted to have flag days. and uh, That's kind of experience. the whole point of Fedora stuff. Well, experience says that, uh, or it's my experience, my understanding of, of things is that you need to find a way to introduce uh, new features in a way that does not require flag day and it allows us slow incremental uh, switch where the old stuff still works as long as possible, as long as there are users. Uh, I think RPM Autospec is a good example. So right now, uh, it works. I mean, you can opt in. You can. Uh, we can, for example, s make a, an automatic switch of I don't know Rust crates one day and maybe Python packages the other day. But the old stuff continues to work, and this is good, and it, it should continue to work. Um, the problem I see is that it, there's not enough integration in other places. But the fact that the the old stuff continues to work is actually a pl plus in my my view. The old stuff working is not mutually exclusive to we actually like actively change things to use new stuff if that's the direction we actually want to go. The problem is that there is essentially there's essentially no path that people are thinking for these kinds of things to make it so that new things are working. For example, a simple example, we've had Koshe for six years. And we've been talking about turning it on automatically by default for all packages for four years. And it hasn't happened. That is a very easy flip to make, and we should have been doing it, and we're not. And that has, and that's the kind of stuff where I'm like, it's very clear that on a on a community basis, we don't have an agreement on whether we want to improve the scope of automation and how 
packager workflows work. Uh, Neil, for the benefit of uh, those who may not be, maybe less familiar with some of our obviously not primary uh, tools, could you de could you explain what Koshe is? Oh yeah, is? yeah. Koshe is a dependency tracking, auto rebuilding uh, uh, tool that walks the tree of things that are in the build system, Fedora Koji, and as things churn and change, it tracks them and triggers rebuilds of reverse dependencies and gives you reports based on whether they're successful or failed or whatever, um, and uh, gives you an idea of like real, mostly real time, the repo closure state of of a given distribution release. So it could be 35, 36, Apple 7, 8, 9, um, Rawhide, whatever. Um, it's by far not perfect, but the fact that it's not on universally makes it very difficult for people to figure out um, whether a change, what, what kind of scope a change particularly has. Ahead. That's one problem with cost is we are testing these things once we ship them, not before. I mean, I have a whole lot of things I could say about about how our, our build and release pipeline works, but that would yeah. probably turn this into a giant rant, and that's probably not a good idea. We are slowly getting there anyway, because when we meet in one room, it's always the natural outcome. Let's <laughs> figure out next question. I can't mark stuff answered because I guess I am locked of a different account. Uh, so the next question is, uh, are there some examples of proactive guidance that the co council has provided to working groups? Um, not in recent memory. Not. Uh, I, assume, I assume, David, when you said council, you meant uh, FESCO committee? Because we're not a council. I mean, we are, but we're not. We don't call uh, ourselves that. <laughs> perhaps. Let's talk so, about the name. <laughs> uh, proactively, I think, well, it's not entirely proactively, but we did, uh, and uh, this is dabbling a little bit in another question we got for, uh, for later in the list. Uh, when we were approached about the Flathub question, uh, I think that we, I think our response was reasonably proactive in, in that we identified and told them what changes we would need to, in or, uh, to need them to make in order for us to come to an agreement about uh, including it. Uh, does that, I, I don't know if anybody else can think of a better example, but. I think the last time we were quote unquote proactive about something in any serious capacity was when Fedora Corios tried to become an addition the first time and the second time. Um, uh, I think the third time's the charm this time and they might actually do it. Um, but uh, uh, that one was, yeah, you're not, in good shape here, and here are the things that we we need you to think about before you try this again. Um, but that's, I think, the only example I can think of where, where like we proactively said, here's what you need to actually become a reality here. Um, because other than that, I think we're almost entirely reactive, uh, and that may not necessarily be a bad thing either, because um, in in many respects, Fesco is mostly hurting cats than it is um, setting, you know, setting the, the, the roadmap. Um, the roadmap is post facto, not so it, it, it happens after people have started figuring out what they want to do. So it's th the nature of the beast here. It sometimes happens that individual FESCO members or even a small subset of FESCO is proactive about something, but it's just because they would be proactive about the same thing, even if they were not on FESCO. Uh, so like as a committee, we are not proactive, we are reactive, but the, as an elected body, uh, it's the proactive people that tend to get elected in FESCO. So individually, I think a lot of FESCO members are very proactive as a, as a committee, not so much, which yeah. I think is, it's all right. That's yeah. how it works. I, I think there has been a little bit of proactive uh, stuff around some of the policies, like where we're going, oh, this policy is not great. Let's redo that. I don't know if that's more reactive. I think not, it could be considered but... a bit of a blend in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. But like speaking of members being proactive versus the committee being reactive, I know like personally speaking, 
I have like somewhere between a three to five year roadmap of things I want to see that I want to get done within within Fedora releases. But uh, you know, that's that's basically like part of the reason I'm on here is to kind of be able to say like bring my view of like how Fedora should evolve and and show it to other people and and make sure that we can put our input into guiding the future of the distribution as a whole. But again, it's all post facto, right? Like these these changes have already been proposed. People have already probably started doing the work for it, even even if they're not approved yet. And then it, it kind of just rolls on its own, sort of, kind of, maybe. So should we uh, try to take more uh, proactive role, like, for example, in the question about Koshe? Because I think that the issue is that there is just no single owner who, of, of, who, who feels like they can say the whole distro should use Koshe, right? Because it's not up to the Koshe developers, it's um, not up to the individual developers, and there is just no owner. Let's do it. Sure, why not? Open a, open a ticket that we want to uh, uh, turn on Koshe automatically for everything. We'll rubber stamp it with our giant rubber stamps and yeah. And we'll do it. Okay, so who, the, of course the ultimate question is now who does the work? It's not just a configuration change, or is it? I it's mean, do, much does, configuration will, it, change. will it scale it's to that number of packages? Oh, that's a good it's question. a configuration yeah. change. It's database change. It's changed the new package flow because it needs to enable it automatically. It's I don't know. Probably there's probably half a dozen things that need to happen. So technically, we can doable. just say that we want it, and then we figure out the details later. And <laughs> it's well, at at minimum, we uh, at minimum someone needs to step up, file the change, and be willing to shepherd it through. If you want this to be a change proposal, we can definitely do that. Let me put it to my never-ending to-do list. <laughs> oh, you've got one of those too, Miro. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's basically like like a buffer when I add <laughs> new lines on the beginning, and the, the rest just like goes somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure mine wrap it would wrap around the Earth at least once. Yes. Yeah, I'm. I, I think I'm at that point about halfway wrapping around the Earth now. <laughs> Um, I want to stop here about uh, when we um, discuss Koshi and packaging automation and stuff like that. But uh, I see one one challenge, and I wouldn't say a problem, more like a challenge that is even if we enable Koshi for all the packages, there will be a large group of packages who wouldn't look at it or who wouldn't concern their package not building interesting for them. And it's the same with pull requests, NCI, and stuff like that. We, we got a lot of very cool stuff. And it feels to me that some of our packagers are just either not interested or not aware or just like uh, prefer direct push to this kit, even if it doesn't even produce the source RPM because that's how they've done it 10 years ago or that's how they've been taught to do it by somebody who's doing it for 10 years. So even if we enable cost chain for all the packagers, packagers, then I'm afraid that the, for most of the people, until somebody files their Bugzilla, or even uh, until I tell them after three releases of their, their package not building that uh, they really need to fix it, uh, they won't. And uh, no amount of automation can, can change people's minds about this. I think this is particularly challenging uh, because if we want to make something cool, uh, we need things to change. And people don't like changes, right? If, if you change something, they are not happy about it. So some so of I it is it's... that, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Some of it, I think, is that a lot of these quote unquote cool things that we have are kind of out of the way rather than in your face. Um, so uh, for example, most people probably don't even know that when you submit an update to Bodhi, it runs a battery of tests on them because it's out of the way and you don't notice. Uh, and um, I, I could also make the argument that that's actually the wrong place to run the test because it, it should actually fail to build in Koji, market has failed and all that fun stuff. But 
point is, a lot of the things that people say that we're doing are all background things that everybody can happily ignore. And, and my experience over almost 10 years of doing this in a professional environment is that if you make it easy for people to ignore it, they're going to. Um, so you have to kind of smack them in the face a bunch of times about the, about the changes and, and the new workflows and things like that before it'll actually take effect. Like I already hear from lots of RHEL developers who are kind of mad that they have to use merge requests for every bloody change into CentOS stream because they can't actually directly commit to the repos anymore for CentOS stream. And so they get a little twitchy about the whole workflow and all the CI things and all that other fun stuff and the BZ approvals. But because it's smacking them in the face, they can't ignore it and they have to deal with it. Like we could easily make that the same kind of smacking people in the face with, with our disk it set up um, for some of this stuff. I don't know if we want to take every single step all at once. I'm pretty sure that if RHEL developers weren't paid to do it, they would all have left. Um, so we should do it a little bit more incrementally, but like, for example, making it so um, a commit uh, landing could be uh, held in a, in a staging index until a CI test passes and if it fails, the commit is rejected or something like that. Like there's a, there's a lot of different things that you could do to make those kinds of workflows more in your face and make people care about them. Uh, just as a side so note, I would answer. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, I actually have some amount of data to back up that what we started doing to uh, poke people poke people to. Uh, fix the packages, uh, for example, the enforcement of the fail to build and fail to install policies uh, is actually having a measurable impact on the quality of packages in the repositories. Uh, I have some historical data uh, because I'm running the, the service that provides the broken dependencies report for the package dashboard. And the number of packages with broken dependencies, or rather the number of broken dependencies across all packages has gone down from over 4,000 in Fedora 31 to just 800 in Fedora 36. So that's 80% fewer broken dependencies in the repositories. And I'd say that's a good start. Yeah, um, I, I think so it's excellent. It's, it's, uh, but, uh, sorry, Spishak wanted to say something for like five times already. Yes. Go ahead. So I'll, I'll be quick. So I, I mean, I kind of agree with Neil that, that it should be harder to ignore stuff. But also, I think that there's another aspect to this. It's hard to consume this stuff, like um, the, the connection between Pajor uh, this git and koshe and release monitoring and um, the q a checks it's just so hard to follow even if you know what you are doing um, so we need more visible connections more easier ways to 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 to, to look at things and so on uh, packager dashboard is excellent um, it doesn't integrate everything but it integrates a lot um, but we, I think we should. We just need to move in this direction of, of having this just easier to, to, to click. And if we're we probably about, sorry, it, sorry, I, I I did want to just interject one quick thing about the package dashboard. Um, I completely forgot it existed because it is not prominent in any in any meaningful way. And I think we probably ought to be at least linking to it from like Bodhi and from any of the tools that we interact with regularly, you know, have a banner. Hey, have you considered looking here for the for all your pack packaging needs? It's not even uh, linked from the Fedora docs. Like, you, I don't even know where you would discover it if you didn't already know it existed. Yeah, so I, I think we probably, I think that's one of those places where we can probably be proactive in this committee and uh, go ahead and do something about that. Sorry, I, I, I interrupted you, Fabio, and, and before that you were cl colliding with Zabinu, so I think we should let you uh, speak for a change. Uh, just wanted to mention that since we're talking about uh, test results in Bodhi, uh, every time I get uh, gating test failures or something for one of my packages, 
I have no idea what the test failure is because I have to dig through Jenkins console logs or something and I for the life of me I can't figure out why a, some, why a test failed or something uh, and I, I just wave the test result because I don't even know why it failed and I, I can't see the failure and there is no obvious way where to to, t to see that and there's no big red banner your test failed because of x y and z it's all buried in some kind of log somewhere and that's not really helpful yeah for what it's worth it's not better on the on in centos stream either it's arguably worse because there's no there's no anything that points out failures it just hey your thing's not your thing's failed good luck uh, the Zool can include a link to the failed tests. Yeah, but you can't get the artifacts. You can't see what the what what actually were the failed things that built because it's all on the uh, Red Hat firewall side. Uh, uh, that is something we can probably work on. Could you uh, file a, uh, an issue for? Uh, I'll look into that. Yep, sure. I was I did not realize that was uh, for lack of a better term, paywalled. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'll be happy to be paid to see the wall. <laughs> okay, so I think we, we we should wrap up because we are we are scheduled uh, until six minutes ago. So no, I think we are scheduled for the entire hour actually. Yeah, yes. I'm pretty sure we are scheduled for the whole hour. Oh, we are. Okay, that's good because we are so popular. Um, that's why, yes. Hey, there are 70 people on this call, so. Hello, That's everybody. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are some more questions and answers. Thank you. Let's go through them. I can't oh, this I is a good... mark them as answered, so. Here's a good question we? that I don't think we've answered from Marie. Do you think it'd be useful to have more connection and collaboration with the Mindshare side of Fedora? For example, marketing, design, ambassadors. If so, how would you like to see this happen? So my answer is unequivocally yes. There needs to be much more bringing those two groups together for, for general advocacy in Fedora. My, in my particular line of advocacy that I do, it is almost always connecting these two pieces together and presenting them in a way that other people find it very appealing. So I think that's something we should strive for as a general practice. Um, I don't have specific ideas of how to see that happen, but uh, any of the others, what do you think of this? I I have an opinion as well. I, I agree. Uh, definitely we should do this, uh, but I see that it isn't really working. Uh, it's not only Mindshare, it's all the council business as well. For the past few years, I think that Fesco and the devil mailing list for Fedora and all the package maintainers and the people who do Fedora changes is moving one direction. And the rest of the project, the council, the mindshare, the discuss thingy, the non not using mailing list stuff is going to the other direction. And then there's this huge gap in between those two words. And then some of our people are actually able to navigate like both of the words. But I think we need to start interconnecting those two words more. Uh, there have been decisions made that haven't been discussed on the devil list because the people from the other group don't even subscribe to it because they don't like it there. On the other hand, then we discuss something on the devil list and Fesco, and then the ambassadors have no idea, or uh, I don't know if we even still have ambassadors. I think we are getting apart, and we should definitely do something about it, but I have no idea what. So the lack of physical uh, flock has been an issue, I think. Uh, hopefully next year we can meet and, and, and actually talk in one room. I, I also think that you know, more interconnections would be good, but I, I don't know how precisely that should work. Yeah, I agree with Zivignu. I think this is actually because we don't have any synchronization points anymore. Like the flock events historically have been the place where We've gotten the Fedora advocates, ambassadors, whatever we're calling them now, um, along with the developers and and, and contri other contributors. And 
we get to refine and pull together our strategies. Like the nests aren't working for that particular for that particular goal because you can ignore them. That like it's it's much harder to ignore when people are coming by and saying hi to you and want to hear about what you're doing and talking you to you directly. Whereas with these on much more structured things, um, it's much, much easier to like just put aside a whole portion of the project. And like operating 100% virtually for a few years, I think is what's led to the splintering as Miro uh, that, and creating that gap. Uh, Um, There's something to be said too for uh, perhaps we can work a little bit in the uh, in with, with the change process here and uh, perhaps we make it more uh, we, we should push for it to be more proactive that uh, people submitting changes also uh, communicate with the mindshare uh, team as far as it, it sort of treat it, treat mindshare sort of a, a little bit like a product management team where they get involved with all with all the they get involved with uh, at least Figuring out how to how to market and how to sell the uh, the new features. Maybe I guess I guess that's not really product management. That's more. Of so so one thing we had that was aimed to make the council and Fesco kind of uh, more coordinated was we have a Fesco representative who's on the council, David, uh, to like go to those meetings and share anything back. Maybe there should be a mind share person also that goes to Fesco and shares things back or. Maybe we should have a Fesco person go to the mindshare side and share things back. But yeah, it's it's a difficult problem. I agree, and I'd love to see more coordination somehow. Yeah, I, I think it would. I, I I think it'd be a good idea to have interconnected representatives. I think the theory has been that mind share, that mindshare and. Um, uh, and Fesco exists as members on council is the synchronization point, but I think in practice that's not working. Um, so I think we need more cross connections, uh, especially if we're in this more heavily virtual thing. Um, but I don't know if council is actually functioning properly for this purpose, which I think is like kind of the whole point of council right now is to be that top level synchronization point between the different wings of Fedora. Um, so I, I don't know. What about the quarterly council FESCO Mindshare meeting? It might be yeah. useful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we could we could do something along those. I, if I remember correctly, council does either an annual or semi-annual face-to-face to figure stuff out, it might actually make sense to do something similar for like all the wings of uh, of Fedora in some way, Fesco, Mindshare, and Council. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to organize somehow. <laughs> I think David though does make a, val a valid point for most purposes that's what we had been using flock for right and so maybe but maybe flock needs to be slightly more frequent or maybe we need to have uh, an in-person event and a virtual event back and forth half of the year yeah maybe we have maybe uh, flock is in the summer and nest is in the winter from uh, once we get back to the in-person events yeah yeah no that may actually that that would work out quite well because I definitely hate traveling in the winter <laughs> So the, the virtual events, they have been great for outreach to community, I think. It's, it's just easier for people to participate this way, and we certainly should keep them. Uh, but yeah, alternating sounds good. So th there was another question. How, how, how do we measure our success as a, as a, as a body? And I think that uh, like one way to, to look at this is just to, to see that if we are responsive to tickets, and I think that we mostly are, um, sometimes th things get stuck, but um, I mean, it's, it's not so bad. Um, but I, I, another way would be to, 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 to look at this as, as, as our ability to, to, to look into the future and do proactive steps. And on this, we are, well, not so good. I would 
like to say that as an elected body, uh, we can determine our success, uh, that people keep voting for the same people over and over again, mostly. But on the other hand, to be fair, the list of candidates isn't really exhaustive. Uh, like, so the, the vote is not like you could actually vote out everybody and vote in a new fesco right it's i mean you just... can actually do that we do let people put zero and if if there is zero <laughs> then the seat does not get filled yeah but that it would mean that happened, everybody but... needs to everybody would need to vote zero so when you run and you vote for yourself you can't get zero well i, I think mean... there's a i think we can probably figure out a reasonable uh you know lower right. cutoff that just says that just says if you're uh, under this average score for the uh you know you are not a viable candidate yeah cool. so I, I would like to encourage people who are here and who are interested that, uh, about fesco uh do you actually uh, like subscribe to the fesco tracker see what's going on and if you're interested in this kind of stuff and if you have ideas don't be afraid to run the the worst that can happen to you is that you actually get elected and then you need to do stuff don't say it like that <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you can always resign when when you don't have time anyway, so it would be really really cool if we could have like multiple candidates for for the next election like it's kind of boring when you have four seats and five candidates or something like that uh yes so, uh, and then resigned right yeah uh it's it's time sensitive yes if you want to be proactive in fesco it eats a lot of your time uh but we also i it's perfectly your right to just join the meetings give your pluses ones and minus ones and then go about your business right and also like most of the time we don't actually have to do a lot even with trying to be proactive in fesco like the last couple of cycles, we've had, what, two or three issues which have forced us to have meetings. But, like, the cycle before that, I think we only had one. And that was the that was the Pipewire one where everybody was like, I'm not sure Pipewire is going to make it. Are you going to make sure you pull it out earlier before the deadline, even though that's change says do it on the deadline? It's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But, like, most of the time, most issues go through without real issue. Most uh, most changes roll out fine, and and actually we've gone months without having a meeting because we're just rubber stamping all the things that don't that aren't really controversial. Yeah, it was much more wild when modularity was the uh, <laughs> recurring topic. Well, there were meetings all the time during that during that one. Yep. I think another thing that takes a lot of people's time is if you want to stay up on the Devel list discussion on everything, because sometimes there's very long threads of esoteric things and people are generally in favor of something and then nitpicking uh, further, but yeah. Okay, can somebody who has the right mark the questions we answered as answered? Uh... And let's pick another one. I don't think we can extend on the internal forge thing because we don't know anything. Uh, about the unfiltered flat hub, I think I can answer on behalf of the committee that we didn't approve that. <laughs> you can read it in the logs. Uh, it was a uh, one of Very the clear cut. <laughs> yeah. This was interesting. I think we will see a modified version of the proposal. Hopefully, um, that might be better. Yeah. To People be clear, are... we didn't approve it as proposed. We pr we provi uh, provided feedback to tell them what they would need to change in order to get it approved, which they didn't couldn't commit to for Fedora thirty seven. So they're going to retry for Fedora thirty eight. Yeah. Uh, I believe the most important concern from FESCO was that we provide content to the distribution and suddenly that content would be like replaced with third party. 
So we would like Fedora content to remain the primary stuff people install when they run Fedora. Yep. Basically, it's a simplification, but it's more or less a GNOME software specific bug because if you turn on third party in in Fedora KDE, it already does this, so it works correctly in that respect. There are vendor preferences, source preferences, that whole bunch. GNOME software has never implemented this, and now they kind of have to go back and do it. Once they do, we, we'd be happy to take it. So is there a dedicated place for technical change or announce? There is the well announce list. The problem with that list is that it also targets people who are the developers uh, about important stuff that's going to happen to them. I don't think there is like one place where non-developers could see what's going on in some announcement like fashion. You can Ironically always enough, we do actually have Pharonix for that purpose because every time we, every time <laughs> yeah, we yeah that's we true. Approve yeah, something, Pharonix puts a bloody machine. <laughs> yes, so th that is actually a valid place to look. Uh, although his editorializing is usually for, usually pretty fair, but it, there is some editorializing in all cases. Yeah, but that is actually a pretty decent place to get a good list of. Uh, and don't read the comments. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that, well, that's a that's a good rule for any site anywhere, except for ours. Yes, because we are all friendly and we never shout at each other and stuff like that. Yeah, never. Never, never. at all. Okay. I wanted to say that uh, it might be interesting if, but again, it requires somebody to do it. And with, with all the interesting ideas, this is probably the most important blocker because nobody has time for that. If we advertise our changes on Fedora magazine or something like that. So you propose a change, it gets approved. Then somebody from Mindshare takes the time and writes an awesome article for Fedora magazine that summarizes the change in the terms that don't require knowledge about packaging or whatever. And then we can share it on social networks amongst the users or potential users. Uh, but I believe that's really hard. We Even now we have the release notes tracker and for every change we want the release notes and even that doesn't always happen. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and I know that developers don't usually are pictured as people who don't like to write documentation. Uh, I don't know if it's, that's a correct or not, but I mean, I really enjoy explaining what I am going to do because I like feedback. But I, I write long change proposals for simple stuff. Uh, usually the code is like two lines and the change proposal is three pages. I'm but, pretty sure uh, the has change beat you on the length for, for a simple change. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't have the energy to then go and rewrite that change proposal to a magazine article because that's like too far fetched for me. But if we have people who, who would do that, I think that would be awesome. For what oh. it's worth, Devil Announce is, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what actually ever goes into Devil Announce, and it is mostly change announcements. Uh, I don't really see uh, that and milestone announcements that all of them are Ben Cotton things, more or less. And and me sending orphans packages that's absolutely not related to people who are not packagers. Yeah, but it's low around. traffic enough that you can filter between them, right? Like, yeah. Then you have the, we are going to rebuild stuff. Everybody stop doing anything. And that's also not interesting to non-packagers. Yeah. So but as, 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 I just wanted to say that if I were not a packager, uh, I would not be interesting in Devil Announce that much. It just has too many packaging stuff on it. But it's know. low traffic. It's low traffic. And like in the span of a quarter, you get like maybe 20 emails. Uh, and the thing is, I'm looking at it. And yeah, so even in the last month, more than half of them are just announcements of change proposals. And then the rest of them are milestones. Um, but it's it's still I think of interest to pretty much everyone. Well, they, but there's a difference for packagers. It's of interest before it happens, and for users, it will be actually of interest when it's implemented. Uh, so I kind of like the idea of magazine articles that you could uh, 
read about features as when, when you when you can test them uh, for the stuff that's not going into release notes or not going through the change process uh, we've set up a new feature spotlight uh, project where we are collecting ideas for magazine articles uh, we've got a few suggestions for topics but uh, nobody actually showed up to write uh, the texts for those. Uh, so it's the same problem. Uh, if, if it were about topics where I actually know what I'm talking about, I'd write them myself. But uh, the suggestions we got were about things that I'm not really an expert in. So we need somebody to actually write those articles. And that's not happened yet. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get the first Feature Spotlight article out this year. <laughs> well, it will also be a nice way, way to contribute for people. Uh, I'm sure that many developers would be happy to have somebody work with them on, on preparing an article if they don't have to write most of the text themselves. Yeah, sure. That would be a good way to contribute. If a user knows about the project and knows how to uh, how to describe how to describe how it works and what it does, then sure, that would be nice to have them contribute a, a few paragraphs of text for an article. I think we're almost out of time anyway, if yep. I'm reading the clock correctly. So I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. I guess the last serious question here is, will there be some kind of open firmware thing part of Fedora someday? Maybe as a more hardware specific endeavor, maybe not so appropriate. Um, I think this is actually probably accidentally kind of happening a little bit, sort of. Like the ARM situation is horrible. And so because of that, you know, we have all these things like U boot to do fake UEFI on a whole bunch of things and and doing, you know, the mobility stuff where we gotta, you know, pretend to be more things. Um and I know somebody's going to say that U boot is not fake UEFI, but you know if I have to control it, then it is then it is fake. Um but uh Whatever. That's just anyway. Point is, um, I think we're accidentally moving in a direction where we are going to have to care more about the hardware services part because the new hardware platforms that are going out there um, do not take responsibility for their hardware, and so the software and the operating system has to do more of it. So I think on the longer term time scale, we're going to wind up doing that, um, even if we don't really want to, and most people aren't interested in it. It's just going to be the nature of the beast, especially as we move into ARM and Risk Five, and and these other platforms that just aren't mature in terms of this separation between hardware management and initialization, and software control. Okay, I think we answered all the questions. Uh, we already have some. Uh, arguing going on in the chat uh that's a good time to end this <laughs> also i just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who voted as uh, that i should keep the beard and mustache appreciate that yeah you look good with it seeing you Thanks. in person was way better <laughs> <laughs> so, appreciate it yeah, if if this was the least favorable option you would put it down or you just like that the uh, people agree with your own opinion. <laughs> Honestly, it's much. Uh, this happened much the same way that yours did. I got lazy while, while uh, working from home. So yeah. All right. Okay, folks. Thank you very much, folks. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, y'all.